All right, well, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. I, I hope and pray that this will be an encouragement to you as we as we dive into God's Word together. And, and due to the pandemic, since there are no time constraints, and I know you're not going anywhere, buckle up because we've got a lot to cover. So I want to start by just asking you a question. First, what do you do when everything falls apart? How do you respond when your world begins to crumble? You see, we are creatures of habit and routine. We find security in the predictable, but all of that has been disrupted with no idea when everything will actually return to normal. So how do you resp respond when your world begins to crumble, when you experience a shipwreck? Maybe it's a lapse of faith that you're going through or the death of a loved one. Or maybe you were diagnosed with an incurable disease, or you lost your job, or you found out your spouse had an affair, or you find out your kids are on drugs. Or maybe it's the coronavirus and it has you worried about those close to you, not just your own life, but, but relatives, grandmas and grandpas, aunts and uncles, cousins, siblings, parents, and even children. What do you do and how do you respond when life becomes chaotic. It is easy to lose focus and allow fear and panic to sweep over us, but God is calling us to trust him even if you feel life couldn't get any worse. We are called to believe him that he has a plan and a purpose even in the midst of pain. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. That's what we're going to see today, that no matter the struggle, God has a plan. That no matter the suffering, God has a purpose. And that no matter the storm in your life, God has a point to it all. Faith, even when shipwrecked. That's the title of this message today. We're going to see three main points today. First, in storms of life, God provides a way. In the storms of life, God provides a way. In the str struggles of life, God has a purpose. In the struggles of life, God has a purpose. And in the stresses of life, God's people can encourage. In the stresses of life, God's people can encourage. And that's, that's really what we are called to do. That even when life is bad, God's people, us as Christians, as believers, we can come alongside one another and encourage one another. And so we're going to see in this passage today really four main things that God conquers, that he overcomes. He conquers storms, snakes, sicknesses, and stress. And so with that said, please open your Bibles to Acts chapter 27, and we're going to read verse 39 all the way through Acts chapter 28, verse 16. The Word of God says, Now when it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a bay with a beach on which they planned, if possible, to run the ship ashore. So they cast off the anchors and left them in the sea at the same time loosening the ropes that tied the rudders. Then hoisting the foresail to the wind, they made for the beach. But striking a reef, they ran the vessel aground. The bow stuck and remained immovable, and the stern was being broken up by the surf. The soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any should swim away and escape. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land and the rest on planks or on a piece of the ship. And so it was that all were brought safely to the land. After we were brought safely through, we then learned that the island was called Malta. The native people showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and welcomed us all, because it had begun to rain and was cold. When Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and put them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the native people saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, No doubt this man is a murderer. Though he has escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. He, however, shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. They were waiting for him to swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But when they had waited a long time and saw no misfortune come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. Now in the neighborhood of that place, were lands belonging to the chief man of the island, named Publius, who received us and entertained us hospitably for three days. It happened that the father of Publius lay sick with fever and dysentery, and Paul visited him and prayed, and putting his hands on him, healed him. 
And when this had taken place, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases also came and were cured. They also honored us greatly, and when we were about to sail, they put on board whatever we needed. After three months, we set sail in a ship that had wintered in the island, a ship of Alexandria with the twin gods as a figurehead. Putting in at Syracuse, we stayed there for three days, and from there we made a circuit and arrived at Regium. After one day, a south wind sprang up, and on the second day, we came to Pitoli. There we found brothers and were invited to stay with them for seven days, and so we came to Rome. And the brothers there, when they heard about us, came as far as the Forum of Appius and three taverns to meet us. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. And when we came into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who guarded him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your word and for the opportunity even, even to study your word. Lord, even though we're not together physically, you have given us the technology to be able to, to read it and learn from it o over the internet and in a way like this. And God, I pray that you would bless the t this time. And I pray that your word would be an encouragement to us all and that it would continue to go forth. Just like in the first century, as the apostles began speaking and teaching the words of Jesus and they spread all over the world, God, that you would still be the same, that you would continue to save people all over the globe, that your word would continue to go further and farther than ever before, and that you would use us as, as bright hope, that you would use us as your church to speak the words of Jesus. I pray for this time that you would, that you would bless it and that it would be a blessing to your people. And we pray this in your name. Amen. All right, so what we have seen already so far is that Paul has been in custody for two years. He's been in prison because he was, he was beat up in Jerusalem, dragged in uh, by the Roman guards, and arrested. And when he knew, after two years, that there were no other options, the trials were not going his way, he appealed to the highest court possible. He appealed to the emperor, to Caesar Nero. And so they put him on a ship that was headed for Rome. But what we saw last week and what we're going to see today is that Paul's not going to make it to Rome, at least not now. He's going to be braving the winter on the island of Malta. God had something else in mind for this time. And so God sent a storm really for two main reasons. There are many reasons, but two main reasons. First, to bring the sailors to the end of themselves. God decided to show 276 people on the ship that they could not save themselves. Nothing that they could do, no amount of effort or work that they could perform would be able to save them or rescue them. And, and none of the false gods that they would cry out to, Poseidon or Zeus or Castor or Pollux, none of those false gods would be able to save them. Why? Because false gods cannot hear, see, or help, or bring comfort. They cannot save because they're not real. There's only one God who can save, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he brought all of these people to the end of themselves. And second, God directed them through this storm to the island of Malta. The sailors, as we learned last week, were planning on spending the winter in Phoenix, but God had something different in mind. He basically said, I have people in Malta who need to hear the truth. I have people in Malta who need to be healed, yes, of physical diseases, but also they have a spiritual need. They need to know the truth about Christ. And so I'm sending them to Malta. And so that's what God did. He sent them straight to the island of Malta. And so right here at the end of chapter seven is the shipwreck. And so it says in verse 39, now when it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a bay with a beach on which they planned, if possible, to run the ship ashore. And so remember for the, the last the last two weeks in this account, the last two weeks for them, they have been in a storm system out on the middle of the sea. But as the day came, they were finally able to see and they saw land. And so during the night, this, this night before, they had suspected in some way, they had suspected that they were coming up on land. And so they began taking fathoms. And so they, they threw the line into the water with a weight on the end. And whenever they saw that it, it reached the bottom, they, they marked it and pulled it up. And the first fathom was 120 feet. And then they did it again. They threw the line out, it hit the bottom, and they pulled it up. And then it was 90 feet. And they began fearing 
that they were going to run into the rocks. Because again, it's night. There's a storm system. There's no light from heaven that is, is giving them light where they're able to see. And so they don't know what this land looks like. And so they were fearing that they would run into some rocks. So they lowered four anchors. But now that it's daytime, they can see. And they can see actually that there's, there's a bay with a beach. But though the storm is, is still going on, though the storm is still raging, waves are still crashing against the ship, the wind is still beating against them, this is probably an indication that the storm is passing. Which brings up a great point about how storms never stay. Physical storms, storms in our own lives, whatever you are going through, whatever pain you are facing or amount of suffering that is coming into your life, storms never stay. It will not last forever. It will eventually pass. And that is what's going on here. Um, a bay with a beach is what they saw. And they thought, hey, this is our golden opportunity. This is the moment for us to basically run the ship ashore, to land on the shore. And so this is, this is what they were going to do. Since it wasn't a rocky cliff, it was a beach. And so here's what they did, verse 40. They cast off the anchors and left them in the sea, and at the same time loosening the ropes that tied the rudders, then hoisting the foresail to the wind they made for the beach. So they cut the anchors, they, they just left them in the sea, they, they hoisted the sails, they, they loosened the ropes, they tied the rudders. They were driving this ship towards that beach. And if you go to Malta today, you will actually be able to go to the National Maritime Museum. And in this museum, you will find four Roman anchors that were found just off the coast in view of a bay with a beach. And they were found 90 feet below the surface of the water. The exact description that we have right here. And now there's, there's, there's no telling. We don't know for 100% fact whether or not these are the anchors that this ship actually cast off. But it is interesting because all of the evidence points exactly to this account. That these are the four anchors that Paul's ship had cut loose. And so they sailed toward the beach, but verse 41 says, Striking a reef, they ran the vessel aground. The bow stuck and remained immovable, and the stern was being broken up by the surf. See, at this point, though, they, they, were, they were driving the ship, sailing the ship, and in order to run it ashore on the beach, but they ran over the reef. And at this point, uh, the ship was immovable. No amount of work or effort or anything that they could do could move that ship. It would not budge. And so they realized as, as it's stuck there, just being damaged underneath, and then the waves are crashing in behind it, destroying the back of the ship, they realized that the only option is for them to abandon ship, to actually jump off, jump overboard, and swim to the island. And this is what the soldiers were thinking about doing. Verses 42 through 44. The soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners lest any should swim away and escape. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land, and the rest on planks or on the pieces of the ship. So it was that all were brought safely to the land. The reason that the soldiers thought that this was a good response and this was the right thing to do was really twofold. First, um, put yourself in the shoes of a prisoner. Uh, depending on what you had done, done wrong, you're, you're a prisoner. You are held in custody right now. You're being taken to Rome where you, were, you are going to face punishment. You are going to face consequences for whatever crime you committed. So if this is a crime worthy of death, then this is a prime opportunity as a prisoner to escape, to run away, to swim away, to get away from the Roman soldiers who are guarding you. And I mean, in one sense, they would be thinking, this is a gift from heaven. You know, the Lord is allowing me this freedom. Now, that's what the Roman soldiers obviously knew the prisoners were probably thinking. And so they decided to kill all the prisoners. Why? Because during this time, if the Romans lost prisoners, then they could actually suffer the same fate that the prisoners were meant to face. In Acts chapter 12, King Herod had arrested James. 
and had him publicly executed. He was the first apostle to be martyred. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews and it gained him political brownie points, he did it again. He arrested Peter. But the night before Peter was to be publicly executed and held on trial before the people, God sent an angel to rescue Peter. The angel came in and told Peter to, to grab his stuff and to, to come and follow him. And he led Peter out of the, se out of the cell and away from, from, from the prison. And that morning when Herod sent guards to go get Peter, Peter was nowhere to be found. There was no one in the cell. And after Herod had questioned all the guards and no one could find him, Herod had the Roman guards put to death in Peter's place. This was, this was according to the law of that time. If the Romans lost a prisoner, they would face the same fate that was meant for the prisoner. And so this was an obvious fear for them. However, they could not do anything without the permission of the centurion. Julius was the centurion. He was, he was the man in charge. He was the boss applesauce. Like He made the decisions for what they could and could not do. He directed his troops. And so they came to him with this plan, and he said no. Why? Because he wanted to save Paul's life. He may not have really cared about the other prisoners, but he did care about Paul. Throughout this time, Paul had gained his respect, he had earned his trust, and he even saved their lives. Julius the centurion, the captain of these Roman soldiers, he understood that God, the God of heaven, saved them on this ship through the storm because of the apostle Paul, because of the presence of Paul. And so he wanted to then return the favor, rescue Paul. He kind of liked Paul. And so instead of killing everybody, the centurion ordered everyone to abandon ship. He said, if you can swim, jump off and swim to the island. We'll meet you there. If you cannot swim, for everyone else, grab a plank of wood or grab a piece of the ship. It kind of sounds like Titanic. You know, everyone's kind of floating away. But grab something from the ship and float to the island. And we'll all gather together when we get there. This isn't the lazy river. That's what I just want to say. This isn't the lazy river. Remember, there was like a typhoon-type storm going on. The waves are still crashing over them. It's still rough waters. But this is how the section ends. It says in verse 44, And the rest on planks or on pieces of the ship, and so it was that all were brought safely to the land. All were brought safely to the land. Now, why is that little piece of information important? And the answer is because God made a promise to the apostle and to these men that he would bring everyone to safety. And God always keeps his word from beginning to end. God has never failed. When he makes a promise, he fulfills it. When he says he's going to do something, he does it. He always keeps his word. And this is why his word alone is the anchor of our faith. In, storm, in the storms of life, God provides a way. In the storms of life, God provides a way. And I know that this is a real account. Everything in this narrative, everything on this page really happened exactly the way that it is portrayed, exactly the way that it is stated. And I don't, I don't want to take away from that. I know that they, they were saved physically. This doesn't have anything to do necessarily with, with spiritual salvation from sin. But God rescued them, saved them from physical death. However, this whole account is a perfect reflection of the gospel message in real life. That if you trust the Lord, all will work out in the end and he will bring you safely to the, quote, promised land. But it's when we believe the Lord, when we trust the Lord. Abraham believed God. And it was a credit to him as righteousness. That is faith. And that is what God desires. He commands us to trust him and to believe in him. And that is ultimately what we must do. We must believe ultimately in the greatest promise that God has ever given. That God has ever made. And that is the Savior. That Jesus Christ came into this world. God the Son became a man. And lived a perfect life. Sinless life. And he died on the cross, a death that he did not deserve, but that you and I deserve. 
And after he died, they buried him in the grave, but on the third day he rose again. And if you believe that, to everyone in this world who believes that truth and trusts that what Jesus did is enough to save them from their sins and to save them from death, Jesus offers new life to everyone who believes that simple gospel message. And what we see here and what we see all throughout God's word and all throughout life is that God is faithful to keep his promises. And he will always keep his word. In the storms of life, God provides a way. And a storm has been raging in this world ever since Adam and Eve ate the fruit. And you know what? God provided a way. That's what God does. The Old Testament describes God as Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. That's his name. That's who he is. The Lord will provide. But like this passage... This life is full of suffering, moments of hardship, even shipwrecks out in the unknown. And the reason for that is because this world is not heaven. This is not where we're meant to be. And we need to remember that because as believers, we want to get past this. Like our dream is to move forward in life and to, to reach the ultimate promise of God, what he's promising to his people, that someday in the future, he will give a new earth to his children, and we will be in the presence of the Father. There is coming a day when God will give his children a new earth. Revelation 21.4 says that in that day, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things will have passed away. All of those things will have passed away. In view of our present predic predicament, what this means is that there will be no more sicknesses. There will be no more fear. There will be no more pandemics. Why? Because God will make all things brand new. And at that time, there will only ever be health, wealth, and prosperity. The prosperity gospel is not for today, but it is for that day that we look forward to when all of God's promises will finally be fulfilled in their fullest context, and we will be with God in his presence face to face. From beginning to end, God has always kept and will always keep his word, and his promises, and he promises us that no matter what happens tomorrow, God is working all things out for the good of those who love him. And if you are a Christian, then regardless of your present circumstances, God is fighting for you. And he is somehow using this pandemic and this isolation and this persistent sin in your life and this time of doubt and this chronic illness and this, this death of a loved one or this persecution that's coming your way. He's using all of these things to make you more and more into the image of Christ by reminding you of really two things. First, that this is not your home. As Christians, we're not going to be here forever. This is not our home. We look forward to the promised land. And second, God is with you every step of the way. He's never left you. He's never forsaken you. He's never abandoned you, and he never will. Throughout this life, no matter what may come, suffering, pain, heartache, even, even sin into our life, God will never leave us or abandon us. He is with us every step of the way. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says that no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. And now this verse is referring ultimately to temptation, but the truth still stands, that in the storms of life, God provides a way. He is the provider, which means that he is with you and knows what you are going through. And when you suffer, he suffers. And when you hurt, he hurts. And what you feel, he feels. And always in the struggles of life, God has a purpose, which is our second point. In the struggles of life, God has a purpose. Chapter 28, verses 1 through 6 says, After 
we were brought safely through, we learned that the island was called Malta. The native people showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and welcomed us all, because it had begun to rain and was cold. And when Paul got, gathered a bundle of sticks and put them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the native people saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, No doubt this man is a murderer. Though he has escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. He, however, shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. They were waiting for him to swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But when they had waited a long time and saw no misfortune come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. And so basically, they, they all made it safely to the shore, and they found out that the island was called Malta. Before this point, they had no idea where they were. They didn't know what beach they had washed up upon. But now they find out this is the island of Malta. And the native people greeted them and actually provided for them. It says they showed them unusual kindness. This is kindness that they would likely find nowhere else. Why? Because, one, they're strangers, and there's 276 strangers uh, by, by this count. And, you know, we have this philosophy and idea even today, don't talk to strangers. And there's wisdom in that, but at the same point, if we, if we hold to that too strongly, then the gospel will not spread the way that it should. So, one, they're strangers, but two, there's 276 people here. And how do you show hospitality to that many people. One person can't do it, one family can't do it, but a tribe might be able to do it. And that's what we see here. This tribe surrounded them, showed hospitality to them, and they made a big fire. And look what Paul was doing. Verse 3, it says this, When Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and put them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. Paul was collecting sticks to continue feeding the fire. You see, Paul could have said, you know, I saved your life. You know, you, you should have listened to me the first time, but, but I, I saved your life. You kind of owe me now. So I'm just going to sit back and you save me now. Like you serve me. You do this, you do that, you go here, you go there. Like Paul maybe could have said something like that, or at least could have had the attitude of entitlement. But instead, what we see here is that is that Paul was seeking to serve the people. Paul wasn't that type of person. He wasn't that type of leader. He lived his life as we should, as servants. Jesus, the Bible says that Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. Paul wanted to be more like Jesus uh, than he thought possible. He wanted, to, he wanted to be more and more like Jesus every single day, and that should be our desire, that we should live like this, always looking for opportunities to give out and to serve those around us, to love those around us. And that's what Paul's doing here. He is picking up sticks. He's doing work in order that others may be blessed. And at some point during this, Paul was bitten by a poisonous snake. And I, I know what some of you are thinking. What, this is one thing after another. I, w I was beaten up in Jerusalem. I was arrested on false charges, and I was held in custody by two governors who wouldn't do anything. I ended up having to appeal to Caesar. They put me on this boat. They, they dragged me across the sea, wouldn't accept my advice, and we entered into this storm. Now we've been shipwrecked. I'm cold. I'm, I'm freezing. The wind is blowing up. I'm drenched, soaking wet, and now I get bit by a snake. And it just seems like one thing after another. And you can imagine his frustration because you and I have times like that, maybe not to this degree. But when we go through seasons in life, when it feels like it's just one thing after another, like, God, why is this happening again? It's like I can never get ahead. But Paul trusted that even though there was one thing after another, that's how it felt. Paul trusted that God had a purpose and had a plan in the midst of the pain. And second, Paul was anchored on God's promise. Paul, Paul knew, I'm not in Rome. God promised that I was going to Rome, and I'm not in Rome. And so I can't die here. And so what did he do? He just, he, he kind of grabbed the snake and just shook it off. He shook it off into the fire and then went about his business. But when Paul had that snake around his hand and it had bit him, 
Some of the native people saw this and assumed that Paul must be a murderer, or he must be a villain, or a very bad guy. He must have done something very bad and very wrong to deserve this. Basically, they thought, well, he survived the shipwreck. That must have just been luck. But now justice will finally be served. The snake bit him, and he's going to fall down dead. And so they, they had their eyes on him. The rest of that night, they were waiting for him to swell up and die, to fall on the ground. Um, but when that didn't happen, they actually changed their perception of him. And this is a philosophy, though, that, that has been around pretty much since the beginning of, of human history. It's, it's the idea that we see in Job. Job was a righteous man. He did not do anything to deserve the suffering that came into his life. Uh, but there was intense suffering. He lost his health and his wealth, and, and his entire livelihood had fallen apart. Suffering had come into his life, and, and his three friends came to see him. And they had this philosophy that the righteous always prosper, and the wicked always suffer. And so they looked at Job, and they said, well, the only reason that you could be suffering this much is if you have sinned uh, against God. You've done something very wrong, and God is judging you. Justice is finally getting its way. And this is one of the things that Job's friends said to him in Job chapter 20, verse 24. He will flee from an iron weapon. A bronze arrow will strike him through. And now in the context of this, it's clear that his friend is talking about Job. He's kind of pointing the finger, Job, you may have escaped the iron weapon, but the bronze arrow will strike you through. Basically, you may have lucked out at first, but uh, this second attack is going to get you. And this is what the, tri the, the tribe thought. This is what the native people thought. You may have escaped the shipwreck, but now the snakes got you. Justice will finally be served. But when Paul didn't die, they changed their perception. They began thinking, instead of being a murderer, he must be a god. And now Luke doesn't record uh, really any more of what happened, but I think it's clear and safe to assume from the rest of the book of Acts that Paul would have corrected their theology. That Paul would have corrected what they were thinking. Why? Because if you remember to Acts chapter 14, when, when Paul and Barnabas went to Lystra, they were in Lystra and the people thought they were gods. They thought Barnabas was Zeus and they thought Paul was Hermes because he was the chief speaker. And whenever they found out, they instantly ran into the crowd of people and fell on their knees and began crying out, saying, we're, we're not gods, we're just men like you. See, Paul was not aiming to steal glory from the Lord. Paul wanted to make very clear he was a man just like everyone else and he would share the gospel with them. And I believe that's that's clear in this passage, that that's exactly what Paul would have done. And Luke, as he's writing this book, would be thinking, you know, I don't think I really have to keep explaining every single detail of what happened. I think it's clear from Paul's character, this is what he would have done. And not only did they interact with the indigenous people on this island, but there was actually a public official who was overseeing the island. He was the man in charge. He was the authority over the island, and his name was Publius, who sheltered them, 276 of them, for three days. Verses 7 through 10 says this, Now in the neighborhood of that place were lands belonging to the chief man of the island, named Publius, who received us and entertained us hospitably for three days. It happened that the father of Publius lay sick with fever and dysentery, and Paul visited him and prayed, and putting his hands on him, healed him. And when this had taken place, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases also came and were cured. They also honored us greatly, and when we were about to sail, they put on board whatever we needed. Can you imagine housing 276 people for three days? I mean, that would mean that Publius, one, had a very big house. He was very wealthy. But imagine him coming home, telling his wife, so we're having guests, you know, at the dinner table tonight. Uh, three, four, 276 people maybe. You know, there's a lot of people. You can imagine her face probably. But, but think about this. You're responsible for feeding them, giving them a room, a place to stay, clothing them, uh, entertaining them, making sure that they, they can keep up 
good hygiene. Like, you're responsible for them. And Publius' dad, at one point during this, was sick. He came down with a fever. He had a disease of some sort. And so Paul went to visit him. He prayed for him. He put his hands on him. And by the grace of God, by the strength of God and the power of God, God healed this man through Paul. Paul was able to go visit him, pray with him, put his hands on him, and heal him from his disease. And you, you could be thinking at this time, if you, were, if you were near Paul, like you knew what Paul was doing, how he was about to go into this place and meet with this person, like, Paul, you could, you could get sick. But Paul knew that his health was in the Lord's hand. Yes, that was a real possibility. Paul knew the risks, but more importantly, Paul knew his God. And he knew that his God was overseeing his health. And he anchored himself in the promise of the Lord. Now, you and I aren't as fortunate. We don't, we don't know exactly um, how long we're going to live. God gave a specific promise to the Apostle Paul. You will go to Rome. Paul's not in Rome, thus he can't die here. But that doesn't mean that Paul can't get sick and can't actually endure more suffering. Paul understood the risks. However, Paul went anyway. Why? Because, because he wanted to express and show the love of Christ. This is something Jesus would do. And so in the storms of life, God provides a way. And in the struggles of life, God has a purpose. In the struggles of life, God has a purpose. At the end of their stay, the people provided them with whatever they needed. This, this is hospitality right here. And based upon Paul's character throughout this entire situation, throughout their entire time on Malta, we know that these people experienced more than just physical healing. Because Paul healed this man, Publius' dad, and then when everybody else heard about it, they began for the next three months bringing all of their sick and people who had diseases to Paul in order to be healed. And so Paul, by the grace of God, began healing these people. God had a purpose a great purpose in sending the storm in order to send Paul to Malta. Again, the sailors were going to dock and harbor for the winter at Phoenix. But God was thinking in his mind, no, I have you going to Malta. There are people there that need to hear the truth. There are people there that need to be healed. There are people there that need to be saved. And so I'm leading you there. And there's going to be suffering along the way. And a storm is going to come into your life. But it's for a greater purpose. This is always what God does. In, in the storms of life, God provides a way. And in the struggles of life, God has a purpose. Now, my beautiful wife, uh, because of technical difficulties and social distancing... She is going to basically hold up the map for you so that you can see where we are as I read this next section. So verses 11 through 16 say, After three months, we set sail in a ship that had wintered in the island, a ship of Alexandria, with the twin gods as a figurehead. Putting in at Syracuse, we stayed there for three days, and from there we made a circuit and arrived at Regium. After one day, a south wind sprang up, and on the second day, we came to Pitoli. There we found brothers, and were invited to stay with them for seven days, and so we came to Rome. And the brothers there, when they heard about us, came as far as the Forum of Appius and the three taverns to meet us. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. And when we came into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who guarded him. Thank you, Keelan. In the storms of life, God provides a way. In the struggles of life, God has a purpose. And your third point in our series today, in the stresses of life, God's people can encourage. In the stresses of life, God's people can encourage. Verse 11 says, After three months, we set sail in a ship that had wintered in the island, a ship of Alexandria, with the twin gods as a figurehead. They, they were able to get on a ship three months after they shipwrecked. And this ship was from Alexandria, and it had a figurehead with the twin gods, Castor and Pollux. Uh, and according to Greek mythology, these were sons of Zeus. And a figurehead is basically on the front of a ship. If you've ever seen 
Pirates of the Caribbean, one of those ships has a mermaid on the front. You know, just ships in the past would have a figurehead. They had two, Castor and Pollux. And this is a little ironic because Castor and Pollux were seen to be the gods that protected seamen and sailors. And it's ironic since they were just in this terrible storm. Uh, where was the protection there? And according to this time, people believed that when you saw their constellation in the sky, it was considered a good omen for the journey. And now I just want to say this, though, because I think it's obvious as a sailor, no matter what time you're sailing, if you can see any constellation, it's probably a good omen in one sense for good weather because you're not under a storm system. And so it's, there's not a lot of thought that goes into it. But that's what they believed. That's what they held to, that these were the gods who protected them. But again, during this time, whenever they were in the middle of the shipwreck, probably these sailors were calling out to these gods, but no answer. But you know who did answer? The only God who can save, Jesus Christ. The Lord who sent the storm, the Lord who directed the ship, the Lord who put them on Malta, the Lord who is now leading them to Rome and to these various places. And so they went to Syracuse, Regium, Putoli, and then landed at Rome. Verses 12 through 16 says this, putting in at Syracuse, we stayed there for three days. And from there, we made a circuit and arrived at Regium. And after one day, a south wind sprang up. And on the second day, we came to Pitoli. There we found brothers and were invited to stay with them for seven days. And so we came to Rome. And the brothers there, when they heard about us, came as far as the Forum of Appius and the three taverns to meet us. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. And when we had come into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who guarded him. But while they stopped at Putoli, local Christians heard about their arrival, and they actually came to meet them. Now, they had heard about Paul. A few years before this event, Paul had written the book of Romans, which would have been circulating throughout this area, through the Roman area, and all of the churches would have heard it, would have read it, would have listened to it, and they would have known about the Apostle Paul. This man, being an apostle, having seen the risen Lord Jesus with his own two eyes, they wanted to meet him. And so they came from, from various places. And think about this. What, what do you think this did for Paul? Well, we know it encouraged him. It strengthened him. He took courage. He thanked God for them. It was a blessing to have them. That is, that is what the presence of believers does for people. It builds people up. It strengthens us. That's why the church is not a building. And I think that's what we're seeing during this pandemic. The church is a people, the people of God. And when we can surround one another and encourage one another, even during the stresses of life, that is a godly thing for us to do, to love one another, reach out to one another, and seek to build others up. You see, even though Paul had wanted to get to Rome for a long time, he was now almost there, but he was getting there in a way that he did not expect. He was getting there in chains. Paul, a few years ago, did not expect to be a prisoner going to Rome. He expected to do what he normally did on his missionary journeys. Get on a boat himself with, with Barnabas or with someone else and travel there. But now he's actually a prisoner. And even though Paul knew God's promise to get him there, you can imagine the stress he must have been under due to his imprisonment. His shipwreck, the poisonous snake, the south wind that sprang up. It says when they got to Regium, after one day a south wind sprang up. Think about how they must have been feeling. Like, oh no, this whole thing three months ago started with a big wind that came. Like, is this another thing? And it just seems like one thing right after another. But Paul has anchored himself to the word of God, knowing that God will be faithful to fulfill his promises. The believers there came, and Paul stayed with them seven days. So he had a little bit of freedom, and that was an encouragement to Paul. Even in the stresses of life, God's people can encourage. Even in the stresses of life, God's people can encourage. But after seven days, they finally left, and they made it to Rome. And that's actually where we're going to leave Paul until next week. 
He's in Rome, finally, at the end of the book of Acts, which is what we'll see next week. And this is what it says, though, the very last verse for today, verse 16. When we came into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who guarded him. Paul, just, just like in Caesarea, he wasn't treated entirely like a prisoner. He had a certain measure of freedom that they allowed him to actually stay by himself. He wasn't in the normal prison situation that prisoners often endured. He, allowed to have, he was allowed to have his own place. The only, the only thing, though, that he had was, was there was at least one Roman guard that was always by his side, that was always guarding him continually. And this led to him writing the book of Philippians. This is what it says in, verse, in chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. And this is how Paul ends the book of Philippians. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. And I want you to think about that. Paul is a prisoner. He's, he, he's been brought to Rome. He's being guarded by a Roman soldier continually. But he has the opportunity, even in his situation, even in this position of suffering that, that's come into his life, he takes advantage of the opportunity to preach the gospel to tell people about the good news, to tell people about Jesus Christ, so much so that he is having an effect and an impact on all of Rome, on the entire imperial guard, but also on Caesar's household. The emperor right now that Paul is under is Emperor Nero, is Caesar Nero, one of the craziest emperors Rome ever had. This man, in a few years, would burn half the city of Rome and blame the Christians. This man would eventually begin burning Christians and waxing them to trees in his garden, setting them on fire in order to illuminate his garden during the night. This is Emperor Nero that we're talking about. And yet, people in his household, people in his family, those close to him were being saved. And impacted by the gospel of Christ. In the storms of life, God provides a way. In the struggles of life, God has a purpose. And in the stresses of life, God's people can encourage. What we see is that God's promise of salvation is for all people. It's for Jews and Gentiles, regardless of where you're from, what you look like, or what language you speak. It's for prisoners, soldiers, and sailors, and those in positions of authority, and it's even for the worst of the worst, people like Nero and his household. But if you're looking for a central idea that connects this entire passage that we looked at today, this is it. In life's series of events, God is always working. In life's series of events, God is always working. John Piper said, God is always doing 10,000 things in your life, and you may be aware of three of them. Who could have guessed that God would bring a storm into Paul's life for the purpose of sharing the gospel message with 275 other people? Who could have guessed that God would have used Paul's suffering for the benefit of all the people on Malta? Who could have guessed that during this storm, they would cut off the anchors, which would be found 1,900 years later, further authenticating the truth of God's word to the people in the 21st century. Who could have guessed that God had so many different things in mind when he led this apostle in, into custody two years earlier, and then from one storm into another? God never wastes a storm in your life but always uses it for his greater glory, your ultimate good, and the benefit of other people. God will use every storm that ever comes your way for his greater glory, your ultimate good, and the benefit of other people. Who could guess all that God is doing in your life when he chooses to bring a storm your way? 
His ways are not our ways, nor his thoughts our thoughts. They are far grander and much deeper, beyond what we can ever fathom. So rest in knowing that the storm will pass, and God has a plan and a purpose, even in the midst of pain. Let's pray. Father, we love you, and we thank you that you are good, and that you have a plan and a purpose. No matter what life brings us, no matter what we go through, you are faithful. And you are with us. You haven't left us, and you never will. God, you are faithful, and you are with us. And you are keeping us, and you are holding us, and you are protecting us, and you are providing for us, and you are caring for your people and serving your people in so many more ways than we can ever fathom. God, I pray that during this pandemic, during this time of isolation and, and, and suffering and and just when we don't always know what to do or how to respond, God, that we would go back to your word and anchor ourselves in your promises and in your faithfulness and that you would give us wisdom as we proceed into the future and into the coming days and weeks and months. Father, I pray for our leaders over this nation that you would give them wisdom in how to lead and what actions to take and God, ultimately, that you would save them from their sins. I pray for our leaders, God, that they would trust in Christ and believe in the saving message of the gospel, the good news that Jesus died for our sins and rose again on the third day. And he offers new life. You offer new life to everyone who believes. God, I pray for our nation and I pray for the nations of the world that you would send the cure. God, that you would save all of us from a global pandemic, that you would help us to rest and to not fear, that you would help us to trust you. And I pray that as your church, God, you would give us wisdom and knowledge far beyond our years. Help us to know how to respond. Help us to know what actions to take. Help us to know how we can better serve the people around us. Paul was seen picking up sticks, serving the people around him that he had suffered with. God, we are suffering with the people around us. Help us to know how we can serve them. Help us to know how we can love people, in what ways we can go to people and minister to people. Help us to know how we can be the church, even in this time when we are advised not to meet. God, we need your wisdom and we need you to bring healing upon our land. Your word says that the nation is blessed whose God is the Lord. God, I pray that you will be our God and that you will bless this nation and that you will bless this world. God, thank you for your word. And thank you that we've been able to travel through the book of Acts. And, and thank you, God, for everything you've done. Thank you for sending your son. And Jesus, thank you for coming again someday. God, we know that you will because you've been faithful to fulfill every promise you've ever made. God, we have no reason to doubt your future promises. They are guarantees. And we praise you and thank you and trust you. And it's in the name of Jesus we do pray.